This video is sponsored by Conflict of Nations, the free online strategy game happening in a modern global warfare. With Conflict of Nations, you'll take control of a real country in the late 20th and early 21st century and field the absolute most cutting-edge military technology as you fight for world domination. I love taking on other players, and Conflict of Nations lets you face off against up to 128 other players in games. You'll have to use all kinds of different real-life units, including tanks, jets, and even nuclear submarines and games that can take up to weeks to complete. Choose your strategy wisely, though. Will you focus on building up your country's economic might? Or play the politics game and forge long-lasting alliances with your neighbors? Or start declaring war on everyone and rely on your military prowess? It's up to you, since with Conflict of Nations, you're truly in command of the country. Infographics show viewers get a special gift of 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free when they use the link, but it's only available for 30 days. So click the link, choose a country, and start fighting your way to victory right now. Every day, Russia threatens to retaliate against NATO for supplying Ukraine. China has all but cut off diplomatic ties with the US over Taiwan, and its military has surrounded the island multiple times for military drills. The world seems to be teetering closer than ever to a third world war. But what if it really happened? Could you be drafted to fight in this future conflict? First, what is the draft and are you even eligible for one? For most of human history, militaries were staffed by part-time soldiers, typically peasants, who were drafted into service for fighting in between the planting and harvesting seasons. This was by design, and most war was limited to this time because without farm workers to plant and harvest crops, a nation would starve. At the very least, its economy would suffer greatly. The expansion of war into a year-round affair didn't really happen until political states grew wealthy enough to be able to afford the offsetting of this cost via importing food from other places. Even then, if you had a very specific and valuable specialization, such as blacksmithing, you would almost certainly not be drafted except in extreme emergencies. Blacksmiths and other specializations were too rare and valuable to the state to be worth either risking on the front lines or having their work disrupted on a months or years-long campaign. Even as nations became economically large enough to offset the cost of losing a significant amount of their workforce, most warriors were still draftees rather than professional soldiers. This was due to the sheer cost of training and equipping a full-time force. We tend to think of ancient economies in terms similar to our own, but the truth is that the wealth of even the greatest ancient empires paled in comparison to that of a modest nation today. Ancient Rome, probably one of the richest empires in the ancient world, only had a GDP per capita of about 570 modern dollars. Today, Burundi is the world's poorest nation and still has a GDP per capita of $1,711, making the average Burundian three times wealthier than the average Roman. What that means was that for ancient empires, maintaining a professional volunteer force was a costly affair, and many simply couldn't afford it. Rome itself could only afford to abandon conscription during the imperial period, when the vast majority of its forces were professional volunteers, serving for as many as 40 years. Not only was the cost of paying, training, and equipping a soldier high, but for many empires, removing thousands or tens of thousands of military-aged men from the economy permanently was simply impossible. After all, each soldier was another member of society that wouldn't contribute to the economy. Instead, armies resorted largely to conscription in preparation for and during war. In the hiring of mercenaries, which had a much higher upfront cost but were still cheaper than raising an army from scratch. Mercenaries were, for most of human history, the bulwark of many armies, and it wasn't until the world entered into Westphalian nation-state age that mercenaries began to go out of style, being replaced by full-time professional armies funded and maintained by the state. Today, most nations have adopted the model of a professional military, though many, such as Russia, still maintain conscription to make up a significant amount of their military force. Even nations such as the United States of America, which has a full volunteer military, are fully prepared to institute a draft in case of a national emergency. Today, the United States maintains a selective service system, an independent agency tasked with sorting out the logistics of enacting a national draft. The SSS requires all male U.S. citizens and immigrant non-citizens between the ages of 18 and 25 to be registered within 30 days of their 18th birthday. For the next seven years, those registered must also notify the SSS of any changes to their public record, such as a change of address. The agency was established by the Selective Service Act of 1917 by President Woodrow Wilson after the U.S. Army failed to meet its target of expanding its forces to one million men after the declaration of war on Germany by the U.S. Now the president had the power to conscript men between the ages of 21 to 30 for a period of 12 months, and selectees were placed in one of five classifications. Men in Class 1, 
were the first to be drafted and would typically consist of healthy bachelor men. Men in lower classes would be drafted last, and deferments existed for medical conditions, especially for men who were fathers or husbands. A year later, the age limit was increased to 45 as the war dragged on, and the draft would finally be ended in 1920, a few years after Germany's surrender. There's a common myth that the US was caught completely unprepared for the Second World War, but this is far from true. In fact, despite having a strong isolationist streak, the United States was preparing for the eventuality that it would once more be dragged into Europe's war, and thus, the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940 became the first peacetime conscription in US history. The act required all men between the ages of 18 and 64 to register with the Selective Service, and originally it conscripted all men between the ages of 21 and 35 for a service of at least 12 months, with some exemptions, of course. As the war in Europe intensified and Japan became increasingly antagonistic, the service period was extended to 18 months and the age bracket was increased 18 to 37. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the service length of the draft was increased to last as long as the war lasted, plus an additional six months in reserve. This draft would be noticeable, however, for raising the issue of drafting women for the first time in U.S. history. In 1945, President Roosevelt requested the draft be expanded to include the drafting of female nurses, as there was a critical shortage at the time. This debate soon spread to the matter of drafting all women, period, though it soon ended in the House of Representatives. Instead, a modified bill drafting only female nurses was passed by the House but defeated in the Senate. The attention brought to the issue, however, generated a surge of volunteers, helping fill a critical shortage. The Modern Selective Service Act has its origins in 1948 and would create a permanent national system to enable the rapid mobilization of the U.S. for war. All men 18 or older had to register with the Selective Service, and all men between the ages of 18 and 25 were eligible to be drafted for a minimum requirement of 21 months. This would be followed by 12 consecutive months of active service or 36 consecutive months of service in the reserves, with a maximum service amount of five years. However, due to deep budgetary cuts to the U.S. military after World War II, only 100,000 men were conscripted in 1948. But in 1950, with the launch of the Korean War, the draft was once more instituted. The Korean War expanded active duty service time from 21 months to 24 months and set the minimum amount of military service at 8 instead of 5 years. Students going to college or in a full-time training program could request an exemption, and these were more likely to be given to those studying economic or war industry critical fields such as engineering. There was an attempt to include a universal military training clause which would have made all men obligated to perform 12 months of military service and training, similar to how many European militaries operate even today, but that clause was never passed. During the Vietnam War, it looked more and more probable the conflict would expand to one against the Soviet Union. The Military Selective Service Act of 1967 expanded the age of conscription to the ages of 18 to 55. President John F. Kennedy, however, signed Executive Order 11119, which granted an exemption from the draft for married men between the ages of 19 and 26. However, his successor, Lyndon B. Johnson, did away with that exemption for married men who had no children. Only married men with children or other dependents, or men married before the executive order went into effect, remained exempt. President Ronald Reagan would finally revoke both executive orders in 1986. In 1969, President Richard Nixon tried to address the growing disapproval of the draft by switching to a lottery-based selection system. The first draft lottery was held on the 1st of December 1969 for all registrants born between January 1944 and December 1950. Two more lotteries would be held, the second on July 1, 1970, and the third August 5, 1971. This would also be the year that the Military Selective Service Act was amended to more closely resemble our modern system, with registration being compulsory for all men within 30 days of their 18th birthday. This new act would continue to classify registrants into different categories. Those registered 1A were eligible for general military service. 1AO would be for conscientious objectors, who for ethical or religious reasons were only available for non-combatant military service such as medics and logistics. 1O classified conscientious objectors eligible for alternate community service and not for service directly in a war zone itself. With a stronger economy and larger population pool, deferments for students were ended altogether, except for a divinity student students who received a 2D selective service classification. Men who had completed their military service and thus not eligible to be redrafted were classified as 4A. In 1975, President Gerald R. Ford, whose son had failed to register for the draft, formally ended the compulsory registration for men between the ages of 18 to 25. However, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, President Jimmy Carter retroactively re-established the selective service requirement for all male citizens aged 18 to 26. In the modern age, attempts to dismantle the selective service system in 2016 failed to pass the U.S 
U.S. House of Representatives. Later that year, a similar bill would also fail to gain traction in the U.S. Senate. However, the issue of drafting women was raised by the House Armed Services Committee, who voted to add an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2017 that would extend the authority for draft registration to women. The Senate Armed Services Committee had also voted to add a similar provision. Had either passed, it would have granted the president the authority but not the requirement to order young women to also register for the selective service system. In their place, a provision was enacted into law in December of 2016 that set up a commission to study and make recommendations on the drafting, draft registration, general registration, and the streamlining of procedures to include women with selective skills such as medical, dental, nursing, language skills, cyber skills, and STEM skills for which the nation had a critical need. The commission would also include recommendations on drafting of individuals to critically needed fields without regard to age, potentially removing the cap on how old one could be to still be drafted. What we are left with today is a system where all men between the ages of 18 to 25 must register for the selective service system within 30 days of their 18th birthday. This also includes certain categories of non-US citizens, such as permanent residents, refugees, asylum seekers, and illegal immigrants. Previous options to indicate that one is a conscientious objector no longer exist, but individuals can still make that claim upon being actually drafted. However, even though women are not currently eligible for a national draft, it's almost certain that an amendment would quickly be passed in wartime to include the drafting of women. This is largely because while women are still only allowed in a handful of combat arms fields, modern war has become a high-tech affair, and millions of well-qualified women with technical skills would be required to wage a modern conflict against a near-peer opponent, such as Russia or China. So, would you be drafted to fight in World War III? The odds are, you will, though it very much depends on the nature of the conflict. Currently, the only realistic conflict, which could be termed World War III, would be one involving the United States and its allies against China and or Russia. However, the world is not as it was in the 40s, and even such a conflict would not truly be global. For starters, Russia lacks the capability to prosecute a war far from its own borders. After taking staggering losses in Ukraine, the nation simply doesn't have the hardware to conduct a war deeper into Europe. The key here is hardware, however, as the nation still has vast amounts of military-age manpower it could call upon. Yet, facing NATO's armies on foot without combat vehicles would be an act of national suicide. And this is where Russia's losses hurt the most. Manpower losses are easily replaced for a nation as large as Russia, but modern, expensive equipment is much more difficult to replace, especially when your nation is under severe sanctions. As it stands, sanctions against Russia will make it all but impossible for it to fully replenish its combat losses of hardware with modern equivalents. Though the nation is using its intelligence agencies to set up shell companies in an attempt to buy badly needed sanctioned high-tech components such as microchips. With a resurgence in European defense spending and Russia stuck in a quagmire consuming weapons and equipment at an alarming rate, it's likely NATO's armies can defeat Russia on the battlefield without calling for a general draft, at least for its Western members. Members on the Eastern Front, especially those bordering Russia, might need to call upon a draft to quickly bolster their numbers before Western NATO troops can arrive in force. China's military is in much better shape to fight a large war. However, a conflict with China is also extremely unlikely to require a full draft in the conventional sense. That's because war with China will be an affair carried out on the sea and in the air, with very little if any action by ground forces of the US and its allies. The greatest land campaign that might be waged by US and allies would be a liberation of Taiwan. But even this would only take place after the Chinese Navy and Air Force has largely been destroyed, leaving Chinese forces in Taiwan at the mercy of Allied air power. It's likely that current Allied ground forces are sufficient for the task, especially as the Chinese would be facing millions of Taiwanese draftees already. With the war limited to the air and sea, a general draft is almost certainly unlikely in case of a war with China. Since China can do little to threaten the US mainland, a war would need to be waged on its own backyard. And with US forces easily cutting off the nation from badly needed oil imports by the sea, destroying the Kamchatka oil pipeline from Russia through cruise missile strikes, China would be unable to prosecute a large-scale war for very long before its economy completely collapsed. The truth is that the United States does not have a rival anywhere in the world that can generate the amount of combat power it can and no force exists today that can wage a war against the NATO alliance. This is nothing like the strategic picture of the 1910s and the 1930s when the world was filled with rival powers of nearly equal strength. 
What is likely, however, is a national service draft modified to bring individuals into badly needed high-tech manufacturing sectors. As the first large-scale modern war, the Ukrainian war has shown the West how frighteningly fast reserves of smart weapon systems are used up. If the US was to wage a high-intensity conflict against China and Russia simultaneously, stockpiles of smart weapons might only last a matter of months, necessitating a massive rearmament effort that the US is currently very unprepared for. If combat losses then extend to weapon systems themselves, the the US is in an even worse position to replenish said losses, given how very small its defense manufacturing capability has become in recent decades. Simply put, the United States is not in a position at the moment to replenish high-rate losses in advanced weapon systems such as submarines, aircrafts, and Abrams tanks. Individuals with the needed skills would almost certainly be drafted to expand this manufacturing capability, and their service would even extend after the war was over, as the US quickly attempts to rearm itself. In fact, by the time that defense manufacturing was expanded to meet the rate of combat attrition, it's almost certain the war would be over anyway. Though it would be critical to quickly rearm and prevent another state from taking advantage of current U.S. weaknesses to launch a new war elsewhere. Thanks again to our sponsor Conflict of Nations, the free online PvP strategy game happening in a modern global warfare. Get a special gift of 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free by using the link. It's only available for 30 days, so don't wait. Choose your country and start fighting your way to victory right now. Now go watch World War III hour by hour, or click this other video instead. Mobile infantry made me the man I am today.